all yours. Okay. So I'm sharing my screen. Um, so for today's meeting, the first uh, the first point of discussion is uh, authentication with Git Tool Chooser. So, um, so I've been working, uh, so I was on, pri on priority, I was working on uh, completing the GitHub brand source plugin uh, extension implementation, but uh, that is currently blocked on uh, tests. I, I think Liam is busy right now, so we could not have a conversation after the last, uh, the previous thing we've had. So I, I, I tried, so the issue I have there is that I'm not able to um, use a mock GitHub server, API server to, um, to stub data and mock calls so that I can uh, 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 write test cases. So I have written the test cases and I am using the already, they have, a, they have an, uh, a class, a utility class which provides a mock server. Uh, for uh, such purposes, but uh, uh, despite extending them, my uh, f uh, the API the APIs I've created for the extension, they are still trying to contact uh, the GitHub server API. So that's creating an issue, and I'm not able to figure out why that is happening. So I, I would need his help for that. So uh, so meanwhile, I started working on uh, how I could do the same thing for GitLab. And um, I have created the extension, and while testing it, I've uh, I've seen some issues which might be uh, might be of concern for us. The first is for uh, for GitLab. So for GitHub, uh, sending the repository URL. If you're not talking about credentials right now, just uh, a method to get the size URL was enough for us sending the, that information was enough for us to get the size of the repository. But in case of GitLab, uh, so for GitLab, there is a concept of a GitLab server and we need to configure that, uh, a user need to configure that before um, uh, trying to open a, create a GitLab project, uh, organization for project or multi-branch project. So uh, the the problem with uh, so there is no problem with configuring it. We we don't have uh, so the problem with this configuration is that uh, GitLab branch source plugin is expecting that we know the server name instead of the server URL to instantiate uh, the API instance. So to create an API, it would expect the server name instead of uh, the server URL, which I could not understand first because I thought that there should be a way since um, internally it would use the server URL to connect. Why would it not expose this or a method to uh, provide us a method where we could just enter the service URL and connect to the API, but I could not find one. Um, so that is something of a concern for us because the Git plugin would not be aware of the server name uh, uh, for GitLab for this configuration. And um, so that's, that's something we have to think about. Also with GitLab, what I've seen in terms of now, let's come to authentication. With authentication, we don't have to worry in GitLab. They do that themselves. So what happens is if we provide the server name, if you can see in the configuration here, let me zoom a little bit. Uh, the user would add the credentials and a secret token. So it requires a, a personal token, a GitLab personal token. So all of that the user would enter here and all of that is managed by GitLab itself. We just need to provide it the server name. It will look, look and scan for those credentials. So uh, so that's that's a great thing in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, sending when we were confused how to um, send the credentials and then I looked I I went back to GitHub brand source plugin to see if since GitHub brand source plugin maybe not uh, we don't have to configure 
uh, I think in the same way, create a configuration in the same way, we would have a user stored configuration for the project in the GitHub brand source plugin as well. So the GitHub brand source plugin would have the credentials. It should, it may have a method where it would not need um, the credentials to uh, create uh, an API instance. I haven't found one. I will look more and I'll ask Liam if there's a way, but um, since it's possible in GitLab, I'm, I'm just wondering if it's, if it's something which is also possible with GitHub brand source plugin or not. I, I was checking, but I could not find the method. Uh, with the name thing, what I want to ask is that since this is uh, a global configurations page, uh, uh, how can we access this if if we were if we were to send the name instead of the URL? How would we access this information? Is is this stored? Um, so this is uh, this is captured by the descriptor class uh, of the particular plugin, or is this stored in the environment variable? Well, as, I guess as in, one second though. Like, are you thinking the secret token is going to manage how you would? talk to the API because that's just for web hooks. No, no, Justin, I'm talking about, uh, so the GitHub, so the GitHub, GitLab brand source plugin expects that we know the server name of, uh, the GitLab server when we are asking for any details. Mm. So, so, uh, we would know the server URL that, that we can extract from the repository URL, but, um, the server name is something which is which is unique for this configuration it's used by the plugin. So yes, yes, Mark. So I I think we should take advantage of a previous mentor and ask Pariche Barpanda. He wrote this code mm -hmm. because I yeah. don't know how you're going to do it. it. It's got me completely perplexed. It's that I agree with your observation the URL to a repository is clearly the way to identify a repository. Why should I have to know a display name that a user assigned to one of potentially many GitLab servers that are connected to this Jenkins instance? But Pariche probably will give very good reasons why, and I just don't know how you're gonna fit it into the API because a GitLab server name probably isn't needed for Giddy or for Bitbucket or for GitHub, yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, no, it is. So it, it, oh, is it? Yeah, because you can have a personal server. That's what that's for. You can run a server on your, in your enterprise or at your house. Same thing oh, for oh, GitHub. Right, right, and, and no dispute that you can run it. And Bitbucket. Right, and no dispute that I can have multiple Giddy servers and multiple, multiple of any mm -hmm. server, right? Absolutely. It's that even if I have multiple of them, the you the server you the 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 URL to the repository is still the unique identifier for the repository, and yes. so having yeah. needing to know the name of a of of now maybe maybe there is such a concept in GitHub as well, and we should gather it everywhere. I I haven't. It's let me look at my installation. I don't think that I've I've defined one. Yeah, let me look at one too. But um, I mean I think. I think the GitHub branch source plugin should know this for that item, though. It like, should have it a should display already, name as well. Well, it already knows which server the user selected for that pipeline. Like you have to configure that. Like the, that 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 particular particular uh, multi branch project has to be configured with the server. So you've you've got a hook there. I was a mentor on the GitLab branch source plugin. Oh, that's right. That's right. We have your benefit as well. You you were mentoring I, Pariche. I didn't last write the year. code though. Pariche no, but you were you were in fact Pariche mentoring Pariche. Pariche. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But Pariche rocked that. So like, uh, and I had some other stuff going on personally. So uh, there may be things that we do need to hit him up on. So I'm totally. <laughs> okay, so a, so that was a point of information, not a uh, let's not talk to Pariche. <laughs> Well, well, and and I see that GitHub servers also have a display name. Yeah. So, so. And it's so exactly it, for that because you might want to connect GitHub, and then you might also want to connect something else. But your multi-branch uh, 
your multi-branch project needs to be set up with one of those endpoints. And that helps with the scanning and all that kind of stuff. Because Jenkins needs to do like org scanning to see if it's got like a new Jenkins file, if it's got any changes, uh, if it even qualifies, if it even has a Jenkins file or a config driven pipeline uh, <laughs> marker file. <laughs> Sorry, I'm marketing my own uh, little plugin. <laughs> okay. um, so, but that's um, kind of why. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. My question is that if I have the repository URL, even if it's a private server and the user has entered the repository URL, that should be enough to get me that information, right? Why would I need to know the server name for for to to get uh, the size of the repository if I have the repository URL. So the branch source plugins have those as two separate pieces of information. You don't just plug in the, the repo URL. What you do is you plug in which GitHub server you want and then what owner that is. If you've got, uh, like, if you're trying to do it on an org level, you do what owner it is and then it's going to scan everything underneath that org or like a GitHub org, find all the repositories that qualify, create projects for those, and then those each have things. Actually, maybe in the, under the projects, there might be a little bit more semblance of that, but that's not something you can figure at the, at the lower level, repository level. So, so uh, isn't, isn't the challenge then for, for Rishab is that in the context where he's running, how does how does he communicate back to GitLab, or how does how does he determine which API endpoint or which which GitLab name is being used? Because I, I assume you're you've got an item context, right, Rishab? There is an yeah, item context, and that thing could therefore be part of a job or is a job that is running inside of a multi-branch pipeline or inside of an organization folder. But now you need, you need information to pass to the GitLab server, which is somehow all the way up at that organization folder, right? The, you need to yeah. know which GitLab API endpoint they should use. And one way of identifying the API endpoint is by this display name. Hmm. So mm -hmm. my my sense my sense still is yeah. it, it justifies a conversation with Pariche. Yeah, I, I yeah. did ask him uh, this question I think an hour back on the Gitter channel, but I think we uh, if we can have a conversation with him here, then that would be great. Hmm. Well, and and it may be that we need to do some if if Pariche doesn't respond by say Monday we can probably ask questions to the maintainer of the giddy plugin stephen connelly or to the maintainers of the scm api like uh jesse glick and um devin nussbaum and liam newman because i think each of those people uh, devin maybe not but jesse glick certainly knows the scm api and stephen yeah. created the scm api yeah. hmm. Okay, so um, so I think yeah, so what's uh, interesting is that uh, the GitHub plugin, the GitHub plugin is what has your repository URL in a GitHub branch source. Yes, and what, so if you go to that repository thing, that's what where you have that. But I guess you're trying to find out where how to get the connection back and forth. So what uh, I'm not able to understand is that how am I how am I able to do this in GitHub branch source plugin without even uh, checking or knowing about the server name? Uh, I wonder if this needs to be done in the GitHub plugin. <laughs> okay, the GitHub uh, plugin is just... plugin which, uh, which wraps on the Java APIs for uh, GitHub. Yeah. That... Okay. Well, so the GitHub branch, remember the GitHub branch source plugin depends on the GitHub plugin, which depends on the Git plugin. 
okay. and then if you look at a repo view, you don't see like that project doesn't have any awareness that it's part of a GitHub branch source. It has a GitHub. Oh, it does know that, sorry. <laughs> it has a branch sources portion. You can kind of see some of this stuff in the UI, like how plugins work together um, because yeah. they'll have their own like jelly labels and stuff like that. It's yeah. kind of interesting. <laughs> but uh, anyways, you can tell that the GitHub is a GitHub configuration that has con uh, credentials. It has the repository HTTPS URL. Um, and then that is what is invoking Git plugin, I think, for GitHub. I don't know. We can look at GitLab too, but hmm. I can I can also try and see if I can find some time to to look into this a little deeper too. But yeah, some of those other folks might know it off the top of their head. I'm a little hmm. rusty on some of it, so. Hmm. So um, I I think. Uh, from my side, I have why I haven't explored this side is that um, I've always tried to when I'm interactively testing uh, the extensions, I'm, I've always done it with just installing these modified plugins, the GitHub or the GitLab plugin, not configuring a multi-branch project, just running a freestyle job for Git plugin and seeing if those extensions are able to provide the size. So that is why I haven't I've completely, I would say, ignored that side that if we have a multi-branch source, um, let's say a GitHub organization project or a GitLab organization project, uh, in that case, how, um, so in, in, in GitLab, I was forced to go to the config, global configurations and add a server, um, add a server name, add those details. Mm -hmm. In GitHub, I did not have to do anything. I my plugin was able to, with just the repository URL, was able to communicate the size to me. So when I started to explore GitLab, that is when I understood. Okay, there's there's a layer which I did not look at. But so, isn't isn't that hinting that it may be that some of the branch source implementations may not be usable outside of a branch source context? So this, the GitLab condition you see may hint that, okay, the GitHub plugin is structured so that we can ask this question, but the GitLab plugin is not. And maybe it's time to say, ask the question to Potiche and then say, I'm gonna go try another one or, or focus elsewhere just because it may be that, that the GitLab plugin isn't ready to answer the question that we want to ask in the context where we want to ask it. I hadn't even thought of the, the, the you described it very, very well, a freestyle project doesn't have an organization folder or a multi-branch context to, to be able to provide. It's very good insight. Yes, Mark. So, uh, so I think since, uh, I think we have, uh, what, two weeks now to, uh, if you want to release this, like uh, these features with the new version so um so i don't want to be blogged i i think i can explore from my side by creating a multi-branch project and then uh, so the best way for me personally is i debug i try to debug the local instance by atta attaching a maven debugger so um, if i'm able to understand how um, the interactions are working there so I'll, I'll try that personally, but uh, I, I think I've asked Pariche if he's able to respond, if we able to get that answer for the weekend, that's okay. So, so my question is that should I move on to the Giddy brand source plugin? Either Giddy or Bitbucket, uh, no objections Bitbucket. from me. Okay. Bitbucket is probably more popular than, than Giddy. Hmm. It's, it's so, on yeah. the flip side, probably also much, has a much longer history and many more authors in it, so it'll be more complicated than the Giddy plugin. But but I I, I just remember that Fran Francisco told me that uh, the Bitbucket branch source plugin is not is abandoned right now. I think that's the right oh, term for it. Then then that's another good reason to you to consider Giddy instead. Yes, that's that's what Fran told me. Um, and uh, oh, and uh, it's this thing I forgot actually throughout this discussion, I, I remembered that 
is it absolutely necessary for us to look at the brand source plugins to get this information for an example right now we are seeing that the github plugin might be able to provide us this information as well so um so is it for so for the other plugins as well do we absolutely need a brand source plugin to get this because when i was thinking about git tool chooser and uh, getting the size i was not thinking about the uh, the um, the layers on upon which the, these brand source plugins depend so now as i've seen the code i understand that these brand source plugins are implementing uh, another plugin which wraps around the java apis with for the rest apis it is a java code for the rest apis for maybe gitlab or for github we have the github plugin i've i've seen that so do we need the brand source plugin because we just need we need the size we are we are looking at brand source because i just I, i i did not know that we could do the same thing with the github uh, plugin but if we can do the same thing with the github plugin uh why would we need to ask that question to the brand source plugin or yeah so this is actually clearing up some cobwebs in my mind <laughs> um so you what you're doing is actually a great test the freestyle project approach is actually the proper way because you actually don't care about multi branch projects because that already gives you the cash right um so yeah. between what you've already done like the great work you've already done and then that like I think your test is going well in terms of like freestyle project. Um a branch source plugin generally just sets up a project for you and sets up a branch source with that provider's plugin stuff. So I think you're going to be able to accomplish this in and and I I do recall that in the GitLab project we were also trying to kind of take uh advantage of a lot of the success that the GitHub branch source plugin and GitHub plugin suite in general was doing so i think that pattern is going to be fairly consistent across the way and i do remember that we i think parich had worked with um jesse and some other folks and probably steven all yeah i think steven and jesse on some of those so yeah you might look at github and gitlab plugins to see what you can get there what you can get there <laughs> so so i think the direct answer to your question rishab is no we don't need a branch source what we need is some some component any component that implements a rest api to a git provider could potentially be an extension implementer in this case it just happens that the branch sources always have to do a rest api implementation and therefore they are a likely candidate to have a rest api implementation hmm So yes, but so, but you're absolutely right if there's a if there's a a, a plugin that provides an API to a provider that would answer the question about size then that plugin is a candidate to implement this extension Yes and uh, okay so I think uh, I will and um, what I also want to ask is that so it, it's not necessary that each brand source plugin would have uh, a plugin depending on a plugin which is implementing the apis it it may be possible that those apis are implemented within the brand source plugin that is exactly the pattern that the giddy plugin uses it's all inside the plugin called giddy and the giddy plugin is a branch source plugin and it mm. it implements so now that but it it's also is a branch source plugin exactly yeah but but it's different for github branch source right where if i believe github branch source depends on another plugin that provides a github api yes mm -hmm. so the so the there are distinct differences and i i don't know on the bitbucket plugin or the gitlab plugin but i assume some some variant of that exists there yeah the gitlab plugins definitely that way i'm not sure about bitbucket so Justin when you say that way GitLab plugin relies on a separate API plugin or it's it's got yeah. bundled inside So there was already a GitLab plugin itself there was well there were several plugins for GitLab um and this was also like cleaning up a little bit of that but there is a uh, let me double check but github.com you can see i GitLab plugin I think is the 
is the implementer. And so the GitLab branch source plugin sets up GitLab. Right. Okay. Uh, so there is a GitLab product. API plugin. Okay. Got it. Uh, there may not be an API plugin, but there's a GitLab plugin itself, which may do like they, sometimes they split those out too. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, there's a GitLab plugin too, which you should definitely take a look at. And that has a lot of information in it in the okay. readme and stuff uh, I, I i will look at this and um, i think the summary is i think you're going to see this pattern uh across mm -hmm. the branch source plugins across <laughs> across things that also have a branch source plugin or maybe mm -hmm. have that branch source stuff embedded in their plugin mm -hmm. and you probably be able to take advantage of the same pattern across them because mm -hmm. those apis are all Kind of snipping off of SEM API also. Hmm. I had to do that myself in my own plug. <laughs> okay, so uh, okay, I'll I'll do that. So I think way. the next the next concern for me is uh, I wanted to discuss was um, hmm. I'll try to really provide the uh, similar technique. I we have discussed that. So, hmm. because a server name we've discussed it i i had one more thing in my mind i don't not remember oh yes so with gitlab one more thing that i've seen is that so um gitlab uh, for gitlab repository if we github we have repositories and in gitlab i think the equivalent is a project and um so for a project, we have uh, the code base in it, and uh, and I think the CI/CD as well. It has multiple things. It's it's a broader definition than repositories. So so to get the size of the of of the code base, the objects we have, it it uh, it uses a separate extension of the API, which is called which basically adds a statistics um, boolean to it. The, AP, the whole API to get that information. And what I'm seeing, uh, so we have roles in the GitLab, right? Uh, per, for permissions, we have roles, we have the owner, we have develop, developers. I, 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 I think I have opened it. We have guest reporter, developer, maintainer, and owner. So one worrying thing that I've seen is that to see those statistics, the, the user which is trying to um, get that information, that is the size of the repository, the user should be the owner of that repository, which then seems, uh, I think we cannot do anything about it if GitLab has decided that, but then it um, narrows down our scope, I think in a, in a huge way because our, our developer, um, developer, maintainer, reporter, or at any levels, we'll not be able to get that information, but for a certain type of role which 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 is i think is an issue so i i did check uh, if if this is true or not view project statistics so here it, it does say that the developer the maintainer and the owner all uh, those three can see this but strangely enough when i go to um, the project API, which is uh, the GitLab done source. Uh, um, I think this is the GitLab plugin only where the uh, instances, uh, the GitLab API instance is being created using uh, this um, class. So there it says that to get a specific project which is owned by the authenticated user, that is how we can get the project statistics. And uh, this is how we can get the size. So, um, so with GitLab, I haven't tested, I wrote the extension, I, um, and I could not test it, test it in the sense that I did not uh, put it in a local instance. I did put it in a local instance, but I was not able to get the size. I was having some issues with it. So um, I, I think I need to make sure that, make sure that, uh, that we may not be able to, like, and not everyone, maybe able to get the size of uh, the project or the repository. 
so and if it's if it's just the owner then that might be that might limit our use case but it i i don't think it there is something we can do about it yeah that might be something that you need to end up documenting or something like that um if it's if it's a specific permission that needs to be set up for that token that you wouldn't already get by just simply setting up a GitLab project. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Actually, uh, so to go back to the caching thing, if you have a branch source, no matter what, you have a cache, right? Mm, yes. So I guess. That maybe doubles down on the fact that you should probably just use the GitHub or GitLab plugins rather than the branch source. Because then you set up a freestyle project with a GitHub setup or GitLab setup. Mm -hmm. I don't that, know if that, that makes is, sense. That does make sense. We don't need those branch source plugins. Because if we have a branch source plugin, that means that we would have a branch source project, multi-branch project. And if we have a multi-branch project, then we have the cache. Um, Mark, is there is there an issue with that statement? I'm just trying to understand how we communicate. How does the user, uh, who's how does the user who defines a freestyle job, tell us? Tell, tell the plugin which GitLab server is being used behind this URL. And I th right now the answer is they don't. There's no facility for they a do. Feast. What do you mean they do? They actually, instead of setting up a Git project, you set up a GitLab project. You, you, just, you just described right. a condition which is multi-branch or organization folder, I think. I mm -hmm. can't define a freestyle project that uses GitLab as an SCM, as far as I know. I've never seen it anyway. Let me just check. But I'm fairly certain you can set up a GitHub source. I mean, the Git. SCMs I've seen that we have Git or we have Subversion. Yeah, I, I don't think that I don't think those higher level providers huh? implement at the freestyle project level. Oh, yeah, you're right. But but so. Yeah. So we're back to the, it may be that the only fallback for a freestyle user is if they're lucky and they've got a job to find elsewhere that causes them to have the cash for that. Because mm -hmm. we freestyle has no way to say, I want to use this GitLab server or I want to use this. And, and I don't, it, it feels like that would be hu a huge scope creep for me if you said, oh, I'm going to add that so that Anytime you add a Git project, you need to also optionally choose or add Git SCM, you need to optionally choose the higher level provider. Uh, just that I, I, that's, that's an awful lot of addition in, in a spot where we're just trying to get a guess of how big the repository is. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think what, you're, what we started with, I think at the beginning is probably the best you can do is try and detect it from the descriptors in the instance and that also assumes that you have access to do that hmm. yes okay uh, so uh, okay I, I think uh, that's what i have to do right now and uh, the last thing i wanted to discuss was the release plan for uh, so what we so how do we want to um so with the Git tool chooser PR, I think we uh, mark up senior comments and uh, I just have to, I have uh, fixed the test, uh, the test case, which was failing on windows. And um, so I think after that, what all do we need for the Git tool chooser? Or maybe should, okay, we have to wait till we do not find a consolidated way to communicate with uh, the, the extension part of it, I think, right? We will not be able to finalize Git tool chooser until and unless we know that how are we going to exactly communicate with the extension, extensions across the plugins. 
so i think uh, then the git tool chooser is blocked until unless we so i i have to look at the github plugin and the gitlab plugin the api plugins first i think well, although but, i yes mark we've you've got a working implementation for github plugin right now right we've got yes, something I, that so for me i think that's already an indication that we should press forward using that um except that okay for now gitlab we don't know how gitlab will provide that information but we do know how github can provide it yes that we that, that already addresses i guess 50 percent or more of the of the cases right there Git, github is a dominant provider and, yeah. and therefore that will be that there will be a lot of people very happy with that okay so uh, in that case uh, if we're uh, so if you're looking um, so we have the github github branch source plugin implementation and um, once the test cases uh, that problem is fixed we would have that pr merged and um, once we have that I, so I want to understand how would we do this? Would we merge Git tool chooser first or would we wait for uh, the GitHub branch source plugin to do that so that we know that, okay, one, there is one plugin which is supporting the tool chooser. Now we can merge it inside the Git plugin or it's not necessary for us. To do I so. think we could merge the Git tool chooser first and, and let others arrive as they can. Uh, do you do you see any reason why we shouldn't do it that way? No, I I don't. I think uh, we might not be able to address all of the use cases uh, for all the users. We might not be able to get the size, but at least we have something which might do. So um, right. we have the cache estimation at least. So um, I think we can do it, but uh, I haven't. So. Uh, I haven't added the instantiations. I haven't added the git tool chooser at every point uh, because um, I've always, I'm stuck the authentication part or uh, the extension. So, um, so what I want to ask is, uh, do I, should I add that within this PR or sh first should we add git tool chooser as a function, as a, as a separate independent class within the git plugin. And then we add uh, git tool chooser in a separate PR, we add uh, the git tool chooser at places where we would need to make the decision of uh, uh, recommending an implementation. I'm more prone personally to the second style hmm. of add it in the current PR so that you've got a testable PR and I can be testing it then after you've committed and others okay. can test it. Uh, and unless that's objectionable to you, that would be great for me because the the sooner we get it to testability the better the better others can can assist us okay so um okay so so i have done done uh, so i have instantiated the git tool chooser in the git scm the checkout step in this pr the pr 937 which is uh, which is a branch taken from the uh, the current git tool chooser branch is it supports uh, the unsupported command the functionality to um, give a better recommendation in terms of JGit. So I think I would add all of those in this PR and then we could merge it with Git tool chooser or I'm not sure how should I do this? Well, it, it looked, as I was reading 937, it looked like a superset of 931 or at least a, a parallel of 931. Would you be comfortable integrating the cha all the changes that are in 931 into 937 so that we could merge 937? Yes, yes, yes. Um, Effectively, yes, 931 has been a great experiment, but so long as all of its content is in 937, you could close 931 and we could then focus our evaluation on 937. Yes, I can definitely do that. And I'll, okay, I'll do that. I'll, I'll merge all the contents of uh, 931, 937. If I remember right, there were more tests in 931, and I don't want to lose those tests, right? There were. We, I would, I would add, I would add those tests. Yes, we have more tests in 931. We don't have those in 937. So 937 was just to. Um, I created it for just the unsupported command feature, and then I thought that we would merge it, and and then go forward. But it's just created more confusion for me. I think. Um, I'm, 
and we could do that as well. It's whatever, whatever works, whatever works for you, right? There's nothing, nothing sacred about a, a pull request. We can open and close them all we want. Yes. So I think the point is that we, we want a single PR where we have, um, the workable git2 chooser for the git package, right? Uh, right. Now, now you could you could optionally take everything, take the things that you've learned from 937 and pull them into 931, whichever one mm -hmm. you feel is. It, it just as I was reviewing the two of them last night, I, I I saw common code between them and thought, ah, he's been working one off the other. That's great. I assume we merge one of the two, and you get to pick which one is better for you. Hmm. Okay, I I think since 931 has the latest uh, so the design changes, 937 doesn't. So I would uh, copy all the additions of 937 to 931. And, yeah. yeah, and I'll do that. Uh, and okay. You might be able to just rebase too if you're. But I would. Yeah, do it however it works for you. <laughs> That's the best answer. There, <laughs> there are all sorts of Git power tools to help you yeah. reshop. There's cherry pick, there's rebase, there are all sorts of great things that, and, and every one of those could be a ter cause you terrible wounds that are nearly <laughs> fatal to your repository. So yes, Git is a great power tool and there are times it would be happy to cut your foot off. So, <laughs> oh, it's just rainbows and unicorns. Right, it's all <laughs> rainbows and unicorns, absolutely. <laughs> no dragon. Okay. I, I think this is it then for us. So for us to release Git Tool Chooser, I um, oh, we um, we need to merge this one single PR with the workable solution. And uh, parallelly, I I will be I am working on uh, looking on the extensions, and uh, I think that's that's it uh, for now. And then I I need. Uh, Mark, I, uh, we need to figure out a way to um, either profile the instance where you have a lot of jobs or we could, um, you were talking about adding a timestamp, uh, which could get, uh, uh, so if profiling is not possible, then we could do it, but uh, is, can we do that? Can we profile those, uh, your instance? You, you are welcome to attempt it. I am happy to give you full access. I have never tried to profile inside a Docker image that is running something as large as my, there are only 4,000 jobs on my, on my CI instance. And of those mm. 4,000 jobs, there's a reason that the computer that hosts it has 32 gigabytes of memory. And so, so I worry that, mm. that the profiler uh, may, may cause you surprises that, you didn't really want to have to manage. Whereas timestamps reporting to a file to the log file are, are mm. pretty predictable. You know, they are they are certainly aren't as fine grained or as accurate as as profiling, but they can give us course enough for this kind of this kind of assessment. Okay. So okay. So I think that we can take that approach of timestamping. So we timestamp the builds, right? It, what it does is it puts a timestamp on each line in the in the job output okay okay so like we can calculate the difference right right so it w when it's when it starts the jgit fetch there will be a timestamp mm -hmm. the next step after the jgit fetch should have a timestamp line as well mm -hmm. okay okay so i guess i would have to do that before get tool chooser and after get tool chooser to understand the differences Right, right. Or, or what we would do is create two parallel jobs that clone the same repository, one with chooser enabled and one with chooser disabled, things like that. Yeah. No, yes, okay. Okay, then uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I, I think I'll, I'll contact Parichai and see. I have to contact Liam and Parichai both. I'll see if I can get those extensions working. All right, and and so let let us know. It sounds like you had decided nine thirty one is likely your primary focus, and you'll backport into nine thirty one. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Great. Yes. So I will I will keep my I will put my intense focus on nine thirty one, assuming that you'll bring things from nine thirty seven into it. Yes, that is what I'm going to do.
Excellent. Thanks, Rishab. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mark. Thanks.